Ever wonder why every podcast you listen to is sponsored by Audible? Well, today you're going to find out why. And can you believe it? This is episode 10 of Ambition Today. My name is Kevin Siskar, and you are listening to this episode of Ambition Today, a podcast show discussing with other entrepreneurial and ambitious people what it means to achieve success, grow your startup, accomplish your goals, and try to change the world today. On this episode, we are joined by John Federico, CEO and co-founder of Event Hero and the host of the Event Tech Podcast. Event Hero provides PowerCore, the first integration platform as a service for event technologies. And the Event Tech Podcast is all about event technologies, where John interviews event tech company CEOs and product managers, industry thought leaders, and event organizers. You can now follow Ambition Today on Twitter at, at Ambition Today. Go on there, follow them. Today's episode of Ambition Today is brought to you by Audible.com. Visit audibletrial.com slash ambition today to download and keep any audiobook for free. This is Ambition Today. Looking to make your dreams come true? Needing that extra push to become more successful? Then you've come to the right place. Welcome to Ambition Today with your host, Kevin Siskar. What's up, world? You are listening to this episode of Ambition Today, and I am your host, Kevin Siskar. You can find me on Twitter at at Siskar and online at www.siskar.co, which is the home of Ambition Today, and also new blog posts each week. On today's episode, we are joined by my friend and founder and student mentor, CEO and co-founder of Event Hero, John Federico, who is also the host of the Event Tech Podcast. Event Hero provides PowerCore, the first integration platform as a service for event tech technologies. Things like registration, lead retrieval, CRM, attendance tracking, event apps, any commonly used technology used for running an event. The Event Tech Podcast is, as the name describes, a podcast all about event technologies where John interviews event tech company CEOs and product managers, industry thought leaders, and event organizers. John, welcome to Ambition Today. Thanks for having me. By the way, I love, uh, I do love the, uh, the title. It was, uh, I knew you were doing a podcast and I listened to uh, snippets, but I didn't get the whole Ambition Today experience until I went to the website. Nicely done. Thank you. I, uh, I, I like the title too. So you just moved to Austin, Texas. Uh, how's life without winter? <laughs> you have no idea. No, I, had, I did not have to rake leaves uh, and I don't expect I'll see any snow uh, whatsoever. As a matter of fact, today is December 11th, and I'm in my home office slash studio uh, in shorts and a t-shirt. So. Well, you came from New York, and I just looked up the weather. So it's 60 degrees in Austin. It's 56 degrees in New York City in the middle of December. Yeah, it has been, it has been kind of warm. I mean, just the other day, we, it, we hit that 80 degrees yesterday. So there's some Ooh. warm aware, warm weather making its way through the U.S. But, uh, you know, all told, it's it's typically... You know, a lot, a lot warmer here than in New York City. Nice. My uh, my little brother actually just started at UT Austin, so I've been slowly building out my collection of Longhorn gear. Hook 'em horns. Yes, Hook. it's a big deal here. Huge deal here. Hook 'em horns. All right, cool. So let's jump into it. So I want to. We always try to find and isolate uh, how people came to a point in their life where they feel they're successful and, and how they got there. So we usually start with the childhood. Um, and, you know, the early, the early uh, motivators in your life. So is there a moment from when you were growing up that you feel really impacted you or stuck with you uh, throughout the rest of your life? Yeah, it was kind of later, later in life. Um, it, it's funny. I think any, any person who's looking to achieve any, any modicum of success, I think, probably has asked themselves this question. That's just a guess, right? I, I would imagine you've, you've thought the same thing, and I won't ask you. I'll interview you, on, I'll interview you another time. Um, All right. So, but for me, it was later in life. Um, you know, my, um, my dad worked on, on Wall Street, uh, you know, as a trader. Um, and it, it, there was a, a point in time where he always told me, you know, uh, save your money. You know, don't worry about college, you know, but, uh, you know, you better save your money for your book and, books and your beer. <laughs> ha ha ha. Okay. And, um, and then, uh, you know, the crash of 87 occurred. And my dad and something like 130,000 other people on Wall Street lost, lost their jobs. Wow. And uh, it was a, it was a massive. I mean, it was just a it was just a blow. It was this huge, you know, crushing blow to the industry. And um, suddenly things changed. And uh, you know, I went to community college my first year, which was just fine. But I, you know, I, I said, you know, something just clicked for me, and I said, I got to get up off my ass, you know. And and if I'm going to do anything, you know, I'm responsible for it. And it's not that I was never a responsible kid. It's just that you know we were you know middle class family and. You know, if I didn't have the money, my dad made me pay for my car insurance, right? There's a perfect example. And if I was a hundred bucks short, 
you know, you know, he'd make, he'd give me a hard time and then he'd pay it, you know? So it was like, I knew my dad would, would be there, but now guess what? It's like, you know, we didn't have the money for college. And uh, if I wanted something other than an associate's degree, I had to figure out how to make it happen. And, uh, and I did through a combination of, you know, scholarships, grants, student loans, and, uh, and, and some, and entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship yeah. helped me pay, helped me pay my way through school. It's, it's funny. I had, I had the exact same situation. Um, so, so you, when you were going to college and figuring out how to put yourself through, what did you want to be? Uh, well, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, uh, you know, always. Uh, but I kind of fell back on what I was good at, which was uh, advertising, marketing, communications. Uh, so that was what I majored in. Okay. And then you went on to several, several roles doing that, right? Uh, I did. Yeah. And then, you know, I graduated and uh, I was like, wow, uh, I have student loans to pay. Uh, I got to get a job because- when you have loans, that's what you do. You get a job. Um, and so I did that for a number of years. And it's great. You know, I, I would say to anyone, I mean, look, if you want to start a company, do it. Uh, it doesn't matter when you, what, what period in your life it is. But there is value to working elsewhere, right? Because that's where you build your network. It's where you learn about, you know, organizational dynamics. That's where you learn about a lot of things. So it's not a, not a horrible thing to get a job. And so in that regard, I'm, I learned a lot. Um, but then, yeah, one day I was just kind of like, I'm miserable. <laughs> it's like I'm a team player. I do a great job. I'm always that guy that people call on. You know, it's like, wow, we have this really big project that's totally outside of what we normally do here. Who do we give it to? It was always me. Like I was always the right. guy that they gave those projects to. So I was cool with that. But then one day I was kind of like, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. What am I doing? It working, you know, working for other people. Um, and so I I figured my way out, you know, so to speak. All right, cool. I want, I want to get to that in a little bit. Um, but I've noticed that there's a theme across, you were in advertising marketing, but most of it, you've always kind of been around audio. Um, is, there, is there a reason that audio ended up being the medium that you kind of felt was most impactful to tell your stories through? Or? Uh, I, let's see, I played in a band all through high school and part of college. Uh, I was an AV geek in high school and college. You know, the guy who rolled the carts in, you know, with the CRT and set up the film strips or the television. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I had a gig, uh, same thing in college. I worked for college for campus services where that's what I did. You know, I worked with the, I helped the theater group or the, when they showed movies or whatever. And I've always, oh, and I was a, a DJ on my, on my college radio station. So I've always been interested. Oh, nice. Yeah, it was, it was always just fun. We just had, um, Rob Principe on the last episode and he, uh, founded, uh, the Scratch Acad- DJ Academy with Jam Master J. That's uh, awesome. You could, can't get any better than that. Yeah. So you have to, you have to check that out. Um, okay. So. You actually ended up, you know, along this line of audio, you actually worked at Audible um, before, this was before Amazon bought Audible, right? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It was before Amazon bought Audible. This was like what, like 2004? Uh, something, four or five. Yeah, that sounds about right. That sounds okay. Right. And so what was that like? I mean, uh, like working at, because it was a high growth startup at the time, right? Amazon hadn't acquired it yet. Yeah. So it was a very interesting, you know, it's just funny about how life, you know, takes you in different directions and, you know, whether or not you seize opportunities or or, or not, you know, it's just, so uh, my background is primarily in in customer acquisition and retention. That's what I do. You need, you need new customers. I find them. Um, And I find them at at a cost that makes sense. Like that's, that's always what I've been known for. Uh, So Audible needed someone to come in and help them hit their fourth quarter numbers. So through a friend of a friend of a friend, I was introduced to the person responsible for acquisition there. And, um, and, and I came in and pulled together some new acquisition channels, stuff that they hadn't yet tried, stuff that really some people hadn't, ha- ba- had barely tried. Like some stuff that was new to, the, new to them, but some stuff that was new to the industry, which are now commonplace, by the way. You know, things like um, uh, cross-registration, uh, a bunch of other things they won't bore anyone with, but I'm happy to talk about it nauseum. And, uh, and we kicked ass, you know, it was great. And they asked me to stay on for the next quarter. Cause you know, they, 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 they loved the work I did. Everyone loves customers. Everyone loves new customers. Right. And, uh, and I was a huge audible customer, huge. Uh, I listen to audiobooks constantly and, uh, my, t- for me, I like to read fiction and listen to nonfiction. That's just my thing. Right. Uh, so while I was there, I discovered podcasting. And so, and I, I noticed that I was, I was buying fewer and fewer books and listening to more and more podcasts. So, you know, I went to management and I said, you know, this might be something you guys want to consider. And podcasting was brand new at the time, right? I mean, it had just brand launched new. the iTunes store. People didn't even really know what it was up until like 2009 even. 
it didn't even hit the iTunes store. I mean, this was like before Apple even, even understood oh, okay. anything. Yeah. Yeah. Apple was not even playing in it in any way. So, um, you know, they were like, oh, that's interesting. But, you know, we just like recapitalized, got ourselves relisted on the NASDAQ because, you know, they had some, some, uh, some issues early on and uh, they, they couldn't even think about it for a while. So then finally, um, uh, as uh, an article came out in Market Watch with the headline that basically said, podcasting will be the death of Audible or something like that. And uh, the next thing I know, it's like, hey, John, uh, let's have a meeting. What should we do about this? <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and so, you know, they were, they were great. They were, they were very supportive in that regard. And, and we figured out a way to, to get them to play, you know, in, in that space. Um, and uh, we got some good press out of it. And they asked me to come on board and, and start a business unit there doing, doing just that. Uh, yeah. So, so, how, it was, it was so how did you go about uh, building, that, uh, building that process? Because, I mean, Audible is now a massive sponsor of podcasts, and it makes sense. Listen to audio through your headphones for a podcast. Listen to mm-hmm. audio book through your headphones for a book. Like, it's a perfect fit. Um, so it's funny that they didn't catch on to it right away, and you kind of tell them. But um, how did you go about building that process? Well, it's interesting. So uh, my, my thought was that, you know, okay, so back to, like, it's always good to work somewhere, right? You know, the comment I made earlier. Um, even at a company like Audible, which had, I don't know, when I was there, 150 people maybe, um, you know, there's a culture there that's ingrained and, and there, it's set, you know, at the top and there's the leadership team has a, has a perspective and it filters its way down to the rest of the company. Um, and so, uh, you know, their perspective was that they wanted, they had this secure file format, DRM, and they would stay convinced publishers to let them, you know, sell downloadable audiobooks. And their model was all about commerce. Uh, and then, you know, here comes podcasting, which at this point is all ad supported. Uh, and they didn't really know what to do with it. So, uh, you know, I suggested that we build a platform. We take Audible's existing technologies in both delivery and DRM, and we use that DRM to our advantage, which is counting listeners. So like the beautiful thing about the Audible file format is uh, you know exactly how far someone has listened into a book. Oh, and, interesting. And if they wanted to, which they don't, because they have no reason to, but if they, well, now they do because of WhisperSync. So I apologize because the whole Amazon thing and they'll actually know what, where you are. They'll keep a placeholder in the cloud so that they can, they, you can start the book over on another device. Well, uh, my thought was, let's just, let's, let's see how far people listen into an audio file. So if there's an ad 30 seconds in and the person listened for two minutes, you know, they heard the ad. Uh, and so that was the premise. Is, is was to was to make it an open platform for any podcaster uh, to use and measure that, and that was our hook. That was my hook. You know, I had it. It's the only at the time it was the only podcasting platform that was certified by a third party media auditor. So they could, you know, if you want, if you had to get your stuff audited, you know, it, it had the stamp of approval. Is it is it funny seeing like like so being a part of that initial process and then you know fast forward to twenty fifteen like. All the you know the, the the embedment between Audible and podcasts is just like so deep. Every podcast is almost brought to you by Audible. Yeah. So so while I was there, uh, the VP of marketing there was Jonathan Coet, really smart guy, just great. Uh, and Jonathan led you know the the core business, which was you know getting memberships, selling books. And uh, Jonathan and I sat down one day and said, you know what what can we do to to use podcasting as a, as a means. Oh, actually, no, I, I mean, I went to Jonathan. <laughs> it's just, you know, I'm like, these are people who like audio. Like, it's a perfect way to sell them audio books. He's like, yep, totally agree, you know. So um, we, we talked about it. And my original idea was give podcast hosting away for free. Because at the time, it wasn't even as cheap as it is now. It was still pretty pricey. Give it away for free and then and just add a, a pre-roll automatically at the front of every show. That said, you know, with, a, with an Audible app. And it would be, you'd have an ad network overnight. Right, exactly. So that was my, the, to me, I was like, that makes the most sense. You, you would own, you'd be the destination for every podcast out there. And, uh, and it would be absolutely free. And, you know, and, and, and you know, let, let a million podcasts bloom. And it's, and it's easier to do a podcast in 2015. At the time you're talking about this, like it's not an easy thing to understand if you're uh, new to it. Absolutely. absolutely. So, so enabling this easy platform is a breakthrough. It, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It was a big deal. Um, it was, uh, and, and this was the audio company, like, you know, the downloadable audio company. I mean, granted it was books, but they also had like NPR shows and all these other things. 
Uh, even today, I think you can still get an audio version of the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times every day, right? Uh, and uh, so that was our first example. But you know, management just couldn't buy into it. It wasn't. It wasn't in their DNA. Their their DNA was books and book publishing, and specifically audio books. And you sell those things. You don't give them away. So the next option was spend money on podcasts. Who do we talk to? All right. So, you know, I made some introductions to some of the bigger podcasts out there and, and Jonathan and his team, God bless them. They ran with it and it became, I don't know if it was their best performing channel. At one point it was their best performing channel. I'm sure now that they're a part of Amazon, that's not even the case. Cause you know, there's just Amazon has such marketing pull. It's, you know, but at one point it was, I, it was their best performing channel. Yeah. So it's, uh, it, it was that, you know, that, that, that cough, that, you know, coffee lunch, I'm sorry, that, that coffee meeting with Jonathan, that, that kind of started everything. Oh, I, I love that story. And, uh, this, this po- podcast is brought to you by Audible. So, uh, I like how it comes full circle now that you're a guest. Yes. I, you know, I have, uh, I have always been an Audible customer. For, I mean, always, I've been an Audible customer since I have one of the original Otis players, which I'm still unpacking my office. Usually it would be around and I'd be able to grab it and show it off. But it's like the original MP3 player. It was just this, you know, because there was no iPod. There were no smartphones. Um, and, uh, and the big joke was every, every employee becomes, uh, every employee gets a, a comp account. And so my big joke was, oh, well, next quarter, the stock's going to drop because you just lost your biggest paying customer because now you're giving me a free account. You know, that was the big joke. <laughs> um, and the day I lost my free account, you know, after I left there, I was like, oh, it was, oh, it was painful. But yeah, still a subscriber, you know. Nice. Um, all right, awesome. So, so you, you have this great experience at Audible. You work, you work some other places. But the whole time you want to be an entrepreneur. Um, so in 2012, you finally decided to make the leap from employee to entrepreneur. Um, like, what was that moment like? You know, what finally pushed you over the edge to just be like, let's do it? Well, you know, after I left Audible, I, I did some con- consulting, which in my mind was, you know, contract work in order to figure out what the hell was next. And I knew what was next. Um, I, I wanted to start something. So it was how do we keep the lights on at home, keep my family happy, uh, and, and a roof over our heads uh, while I figured that out. Um, Although I took it very seriously, of course, right? You know, every happy client is referral to a new client. So, you know, you never want to mess with that. But ultimately, I knew that wasn't where I wanted to go. So I met my co-founder at an event. He was walking around, you know, with a, with a badge, a sticky badge with a QR code on it. It said, scan me. So I'm like, all right, I'll scan it. See what it's about. And, uh, and then my, that's where I found out that we both had an interest in events. And, and just, uh, you know, it was about the time when Meetup was really starting to blow up. You know, and everyone, when Meetup came out, right, everyone looked at it and they were like, wait a minute, you want me to facilitate offline connections with online? That's just weird, dude, right? Meanwhile, it was, it's totally, it was totally spot on. We were so, you know, mired in, um, uh, we were so mired in, uh, uh, in that, that aspect of everything being online, online publishing, online advertising, online this. Um, and, uh, so it was a, it w- we had this interest and we knew there was a lot of inefficiencies and we thought technology could make, could make the difference. And that's kind of when we started. Okay. And then what, so the consulting carried you over. Um, and then, so what was the first few years of Event Hero like? Um, what was the initial goal of Event Hero, I guess? We started out as a feature, not a company, right? So we thought it would be great to, uh, we created this app that plugged into to meet up in Eventbrite and you know, anyone who registered for the event had the opportunity to uh, go to event hero, create an account, connect their social networks, put in a few keywords, and then we would tell you who to meet and why at the event. Um, and that was okay. People liked it, but you know, even then we knew it was just a, it was just a toy. It was a test. And then uh, we began, someone noticed the, the QR code badges that we also produced as part of that whole networking thing and asked us and said, hey, could you, could you just produce you know, badges for us uh, that allow, and allow our exhibitors uh, to scan badges and capture contact information? And so I was like, well, that's 30-year-old technology. That's called lead retrieval. You could get it right now. And uh, the customer's response was, well, yeah, but nobody will come talk to me for less than 20,000 an event. And we do 25 events a year. And nobody wants to ship around, you know, old, like, laser scanners. So we said, hmm. And six weeks later, we had a full-on, you know, lead retrieval system in the cloud using smartphones and, and our, our badge generator. Uh, and then, you know, kind of grew it feature by feature, customer by customer from there. 
Wow. So yeah, that's a, that's a huge inefficiency that uh, you found. So customer, customer, and then what year did you found Event Hero? 2012, right? So after the break, I want to talk a little bit about where is it at today? I think uh, you actually founded the company as Quirious, right? <laughs> actually it's curious curious it's exactly that's exactly why it's not curious anymore and we can talk about that when we come so back. so we're gonna talk about rebranding your company we're gonna talk about the future of podcasting and uh, the ambition today question of the day so we'll take a break and then we'll be right back this is ambition today with kevin siska we'll be right back today's partner of ambition today is of course audible.com. Visit audibletrial.com slash ambition today to download and keep any audiobook for free. So John, I have you here. We heard the incredible story about how you used to work at Audible. Do you use Audible? <laughs> oh my God. You should see the number of books in my Audible library. Like really? when, Do you know the number? Uh, I can tell you right now. The, the day that when they first launched uh, the Audible app, so the actual iPhone app, which sounds so weird today. When we back in the day, there was no app. We had a, you know, there was an iPod, and before that, there was the uh, Otis device. That's all uh, I know is the app. And I had so many things in my uh, library that it broke. I broke it, and uh, so I contacted my friends there in QA, and I was like, "Guys, this doesn't work with my library." What do you mean it doesn't work with your library? I don't know what it is. It's like it's got to be like fifteen hundred books, maybe more. Wow, it's, it's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> Um, so what's your favorite book you listened to recently? Recently? Uh, all right. So there's, oh God, there's so many. Uh, Bossy Pants by Tina Fey was great. It was funny. Okay. Uh, my wife and I listened to that on our drive to Austin when we moved from New York not too long ago. Uh, so I would check that out. Um, Traction uh, by Gabriel Weinberg. Great book. Okay. Yeah, that's a great book. Great book for entrepreneurs. Uh, the Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. So if you have any interest in stoicism, uh, which I do, uh, it's, a, it's a great, it's an awesome book. And it, it's not like um, any of the Greek or Roman, uh, I should say, Roman uh, books that are, uh, that are very formal, et cetera. You know? uh, probably the best book, and I almost, I'm almost hesitant to tell anyone about this because they'll start using it, is Pitch Anything by Oren Cloth. Okay. Warren introduced me to a method that he uses to pitch uh, that I have used. And every time I've used it, I, uh, to, since that time, I, I've won the business. And I have a big, I have a big pitch coming up uh, on Monday uh, in D.C. And I intend, uh, you can bet your ass, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use uh, that format. Uh, it's a huge piece of business. Uh, and you can bet I'm going to use it. All right. That's awesome. Well, uh, if any of you out there want to get your free book or check out any of the books that uh, John mentioned for free, you can go to www.audibletrial.com slash ambition today to download and listen to any audiobook for free. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash ambition today. Uh, now back to this episode of Ambition Today. You're listening to Ambition Today. Visit us now at siskar.co. Welcome back. We're here with John Federico, co-founder and CEO of Event Hero and also host of the Event Tech Podcast. Um, so John, we were, before the break, we were talking about how Event Hero was previously called uh, Quirious or Curious. I'm not quite sure. Uh, maybe that's why you changed the name. Uh, so why did you change the name and uh, how was rebranding the business? Yeah. Well, first of all, this is especially embarrassing because anyone who knows me knows that I've done a lot of brand work. Um, but you know, we just thought we were, we, yeah, oh, by the way, so brand work means, you know, naming, renaming, uh, taglines, uh, you know, positioning, uh, communicate all the stuff that goes around that. And, uh, my co-founder registered, uh, curious, Q R I O dot U S. And we were using, we thought we were so clever cause you know, we had QR codes on the name badges. Oh, let's call ourselves curious. That's just, that's, that's so cool. And meanwhile, it went against every, every rule in the book. But I was like, yeah, let's just do it. It was a short URL and, you know. Um, and, you know, even when I would get customers on the phone. So rule number one, you know, to any, any entrepreneurs out there is that if a customer doesn't know how to pronounce your name, it makes them feel stupid and uncomfortable. Don't do that. Okay. <laughs> just don't do that. And so you don't know how many times I work with customers who loved us and loved what we did. They couldn't even tell other, comp other people what the name of our company was because they didn't know how to pronounce it. So it was just, it was just horrible. So finally we just said, all right, this has got to change. And, um, 
Event Hero is, we went with Event Hero. It's not the most unique name. We hear all types of hero. There's Delivery Hero and this hero. and uh, But we liked it. And, and our perspective is, uh, you know, we help you, the customer, be, a, you know, the event planner, be a hero. You know, we like to say sm- smarter events make you a hero, make you the hero. Uh, and so it worked for us. So we, but the real reason we made the change is because Curious just sucked. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes that happens. Uh, that's that's an important lesson. You know, make sure people can pronounce your company name, or they can't. Word of mouth virality just goes out the window. Exactly. Yeah. Um, all right. Cool. So being as you named the company Event Hero, I'm assuming that there's some sort of superhero nerd in you. And uh, the last few episodes. We had a guest on Beatrice, whose first business was a comic book store, and then Jeff Wald mentored her. So there's been a theme of this one question, so I'm going to ask you it. Um, who would win in a fight, Batman or Superman? I love that question. So Batman is, is, not, is a highly trained, uh, uh, heavily tech-outfitted individual, but he's still a man. He's still just a man. Superman is, well, Superman, right? I mean, he flies. It's Superman. You know, he's got, so like, it, there's no question it would be Superman. Okay, but this was brought up actually. What if he has a kryptonite ring in his utility belt? <laughs> well, that, that would be more of a deterrent than a, than a, right? That would be more of a reason for him to, to run away than to stick around and try to finish, right? It's just, you know, if someone puts me at a, it puts me on unequal ground during a fight, well, I'm going to change the venue to where I'm, you know, right. That would be my, all right. I like it. So I, that could I, be, we could argue that my God, we could probably argue that for days. We could argue that for a while. That's, yeah. that's, that's a, I think might be my favorite question I've been asking, but, uh, it's great actually. All right. So back to the, back to the actual interview here. So where, where's the event here today and what's next for the company? Uh, today. So today, let's see. We, today we do, uh, well, we do, okay, well, I should say we're in transition. Let's start there. So why are we in transition and what do we do? So, so since the days where we did, we allowed this thing called lead retrieval, like scan a badge, capture, capture information, add notes. Um, we've added a whole bunch of other things to that that our customers have asked for. Things like attendance tracking. So you can track where people go during conferences, like, you know, which sessions they go to. Um, analytics. So we can tell you exactly what the, what the traffic flow was like at your event based on the scanning of badges, for example. Like of people walking around in the, in the room? Not quite literally, not like that. Um, but, we, but we could say, okay, someone checked in at 11 a.m. and they went to this session at 11.30, and then they went to this session at 12.45, right? Uh, so we could tell you so those sorts of things. Very cool. Uh, and then based on those triggers, we would do stuff like, uh, you know, it, it, like 10 minutes after a session, send people a survey. How would you rate the speaker? you know, all, all mobile optimized. Um, so it's, it's event management primarily targeted at conferences and, and corporate meetings. Um, but our key differentiator there was always uh, integrations. And so what do I mean by that? The world does not need yet another online event registration system. Okay? The last time I checked, which was over the summer, there's over 300 of them available in the U.S. right now. Some examples being... Uh, Eventbrite, who is an industry leader, Cvent, also an industry leader, uh, and then I could name a bazillion of them that you've never heard of. Sign up one two three or Waboom, which happens to be a partner of ours. Uh, you, you, I mean, so many of them. Okay. Uh, so, many of them. so we said, look, why don't we just integrate with the, with people's favorite platforms? So we did. So we already we were one of Eventbrite's early integration partners. Uh, we started with Eventbrite and then we added, you know, things like Reg Online and a bunch of others. And it got to a point where we actually built an entire backend so that we could spin up an integration with a new in a registration platform in an afternoon, uh, I, really in an hour. But of course you want to at least give it a few hours to test and hang on and test. Right. Um, and so every time we work with a new customer, they would say to us, John, that was incredible. I didn't have to touch my data. Everything just flowed. It all worked together. Do you also integrate with you name it, my event app, my audience response system, my CRM system, uh, my badging system. Uh, I, c- I could go on and on. If, if you know anything about events, there's tons and tons of technologies. So when you hear that three, four, or five times, you think it's coincidence, right? When you hear that 30, 40, 50, 100 times, you, you, know, you sit back and say, what business are we really in? 
Like, where do we add the most value? We provided a good service, but the reason people kept selecting us is because they didn't have to change their existing workflows. They could just plug in their, their registration system. We support 14 of them now. And, uh, and the only reason we su- support only 14 is because we only support a new one when a customer asks. You know, if we spend a few weeks, we could just integrate with all the ones that had APIs and, you know, that number would jump considerably. So people were selecting us for our integrations. And so we did a lot of customer development and we found that this was a huge, huge pain point for, you know, organizers, large and small. So we are now rolling out uh, slowly, starting in January, uh, what we call the Event Hero Power Core. And it's, it's an integration platform as a service for event technologies. So you'll be able to, uh, so step one, you'll be able to connect to, use a single API, our API, to connect to any of the registration systems we support. That's step one. So it'll be 14 on day one. And three weeks later, we intend to just pile on all the other integrations. We'll probably hit about 35 uh, come February. Nice. Uh, and then you'll be able to, and then we'll, we'll slowly but surely add uh, additional integrations. So our, our first one after that is going to be Infusionsoft. There's a huge demand for integrating registration systems with Infusionsoft so that people can use the marketing automation tools in, in Infusionsoft to better qualify customers, uh, you know, uh, deliver campaigns, that sort of thing. So, so our goal is to, connect, is to be the plumbing for the event tech industry, which is, last we checked, a $565 billion industry, of which about $4 billion is spent on tech every year. So now that we have some, some you know, where event here is at and where it's going, I wanted to ask you because going back to that branding and marketing from your early days, you've, you've applied a lot of that to, you know, Event Hero and some of the success the company's seen, right? Because I think you're the author of uh, the Eventbrite, or Eventbrite Superpowers Revealed, the Event Tech Podcast. How do you view content marketing's role in, the, you know, your company? Uh, it's everything. I, it, it's absolutely everything. Now, I can't speak for, uh, for every company. Every company's different. But I can tell you that outbound doesn't work for us. Uh, let me take a step back. Actually, outbound did not work. Did, did not work for the uh, event management platform. So the platform, how we got started, uh, where we're going, outbound, a combination of inbound and outbound seems to work well. But we'll get into that in a minute. But to date, outbound does not work. And how do I know this? Because can I you, hire. Can you unpack some of those terms for some of the audience that might not be familiar with the with the content marketing jargon? Great. That's awesome. Uh, I have jargon jail on my podcast, which means I stop everything. You go into jargon jail until I let you out. So I'm in jargon jail. So outbound marketing and sales outbound, really, it's more about sales. Uh, outbound is really just, you know, reaching out to customers, you know, finding leads, reaching out to customers through cold call email, uh, and, and, you know, asking them if you can help with their business. I mean, that's a very generic, you know, method of saying it. Uh, you're reaching out to potential customers. Inbound is producing content that is that is so interesting uh, to your target audience that they consume it. And as they consume it, you're providing value because you're not just providing ads, you're providing real value, you know, stuff that they can use, they can learn from. Um, and then through that relationship build, which can take quite a while, uh, it will generate, over time, it will generate leads. Okay. And then how do you define content marketing today? Uh, well, f- content marketing is any content you produce that someone can consume uh, that they find helpful and useful that ties directly back to your brand and to your services. Okay, cool. So, so we, got, we got those out of the way. So where were you in your story and how you're using it today? So uh, I know that outbound does not work. Um, I hired uh, a sales guy um, who I loved, who was great. He was a go-getter, uh, who did 1,200 outbound touches. 1,200. And we got zero business from that. Now, the decision-making process is different. It, it, for events of all sizes, et cetera, we were smoke, fo- focused on small to mid- medium-sized events. And so I, I can tell you why that didn't work. But at the time, we weren't going after large uh, or organizations. That, and so we, we, we got zero business. However, for every blog post I write, I, I get a few leads. And, and that would just happen. Now, it's not just the posts, of course. You know, um, uh, you, know you have to have distribution. So building up followers on Twitter, uh, you know, uh, publishing to Facebook. Uh, when, you're, when, you're just getting, when you're just getting started out, how do you, what advice do you have to start building that audience? Uh, offer something of value. Uh, I, you know, there's something about the events industry. It's, it's so self-promotional. 
Well, think about an event, for a conference for a minute or a trade show. It's such a weird environment, right? It's so unnatural. You, you walk into this place where there's company after company in 10-foot stalls, and, and, and they're screaming at you, if not literally, then at least visually, right, to come and speak to them. And it's all so self-promotional. And so many people in this industry write posts just that way. Here's why you should choose our company. And that's a blog post. <laughs> that's not a blog post. That's, that's an ad. Right. Um, a blog post is, uh, here's one example, how to use Eventbrite to sell exhibition booths and sponsorships. I wrote a blog post on that. It's one of our most popular blog posts. More importantly, I wrote a book uh, that, we, uh, that we co-promoted with Eventbrite called Eventbrite Superpowers Revealed. Uh, how to use Eventbrite to, uh, uh, to optimize uh, trade shows, expos, et cetera, that sort of thing. And um, promoted the hell out of that. That thousands and thousands of downloads of that book uh, have occurred since it was launched, launched in March of this year. Uh, Congrats. And we, thank you. And we still you know, have a few hundred downloads every month. Um, and, then, and then I would deliver follow-on. So the, 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 the message there was anyone who signed up for the book, you give me an email, I give you a book. And then the only reason I will email you is when I have updates to the book. And so the whole blog, blog post I just mentioned about uh, how to sell sponsorships using Eventbrite went out to all those people. So like every month I'll write an update to the book uh, and I'll send out that post and it brings people back to the site. And, you know, one or two of them click and say, I'd like a demo. Okay, great. Let's set that up. So inbound works for this market. For the small to medium size event planner, inbound is the way to go. All right. So, but there's all these different channels. So you did a book, uh, the blog posts, you know, your Twitter, your, your the, the distribution pipes, your, your Facebook followers, et cetera. Um, so where's the podcast play a role in that? You know, podcast. So we're a niche podcast. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt about it, right? It's, uh, you, you know, when you look at something like ambition today, which can have a very wide audience because ambition, everyone has ambition, right? And it's like, what does De- it mean? D- debatable, but okay. Well, that is that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, but no, but, but everyone can relate to that, right? Uh, whether you want to be an entrepreneur or whether you want to work in a corporation, you still have ambition, right? Whether you, have, whether, whether you want to make a, a, a dent in the universe, you know, through nonprofits or social good or whatever it might be, right? So that's a nice broad concept and people can get their hands around it. I went opposite. I said, we're only about events and we're only about event tech. Holy cow, is that niche? But uh, so, you know, we just finally grew to about 3,000 uh, subscribers a month. But when you think about how niche, niche that, that, that podcast is, I'm, I'm thrilled with 3,000 a month because those are all people who are very specifically interested in event technology. And it works for us. But where it really works for us is uh, I interview uh, people who I find my audience will find interesting. And as a result, I build relationships. And so for me, the real value of the podcast is building relationship with my, relationships with my guests. That is the real value for me. Uh, it's, not, it's not about mass distribution. It does help. I, I, get, you know, I get inbound leads. You know, hey, I heard the interview with so-and-so. Um, I'd like a demo. Okay, great. Um, but more importantly, it's about relationship building. I, I agree with that. And, I, and secondly, it's just a lot of fun. Uh, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> since I got into it, it's just, it's a lot of fun. You get to hear stories from people that you would not hear in a bar setting or, you know, hanging out over coffee, uh, people's life stories. And so like, that's, that's really what I enjoy. Um, so I totally second that. Um, so talking about podcasting. So obviously last year serial came out. Uh, there seems to be in the last year, a complete blow up of podcasting. Uh, where do you, where do you see podcasting going, uh, being as you saw it from its early days? Yeah. Serial was an inflection point to, to say the least. Uh, there's also going to be, uh, some new measurement, uh, methodologies coming out that will be industry supported. Um, they're in the works. Uh, they're not, shall we say ratified for lack of a better term, but, but they're in the works. Um, and so those two things, you know, the, 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 the serial podcast and now these new, me- these new opportunities for measurement are going to really have big content players into, you know, going to get them into the game. It doesn't mean that there isn't a market for indie podcasts uh, like yours and mine. Uh, and it doesn't mean that those people won't make money 
But now people are going to be start putting some serious resources into uh, into producing the content. And so all of the things we used to say in the early days, which was you should have high quality content, high quality production values. Uh, you should uh, distribute, I'm sorry, you, sh- you should produce your show regularly. Uh, you should have good distribution. You should use all your social channels. All those things that we talked about in the early days are going to become so much more important now because when uh, CNN gets in the game, and they've, all, they've always been in the game, but they've just doubled down on podcasting. Now suddenly, you know, there's only, there are only so many hours in the day. Right. And so you're now competing with all of these other media outlets for attention. Uh, so there's going to be another boom and a bust um, just in, in terms of sheer volume of content. Uh, but it, it's, I think it, it's, it's definitely here to stay and it will definitely be a money-making opportunity. And I think you bring up a good point. Uh, and this is not just happening with podcasts. And this is happening as like a global trend with iPhones and apps and Netflix and newspapers. Is there's a, We're shifting from like a battle for people's money because boredom and those hours of anyone's day are completely gone. It's a battle for people's time. Time right. is overtaking the value of money uh, exponentially, in my opinion. I've always said that. I've been involved in media and, and uh, new media, you know, especially for the past... Well, many years. I, I'm the old guy in the room now. I never thought I'd say that. Um, and uh, and early on, even I would ask I would ask people, executives, who's your competition? And they would say this. If it was a magazine, they would say this magazine. Or if it was a TV show, they would say this TV show. And I'm like, no, no. Your competition is radio, TV, the internet, games. Uh, you know, podcasts. Like that's your competition because you are competing for time. Right. You know, you're totally not. Agree. It's, you're not competing for share of market. You're not, you're not competing for ratings where it's like, oh, well, you know, CNN scored a, a 2.3, uh, uh, you know, in prime time. It doesn't mean anything. So. Right. It doesn't mean they're watching another show. It means that they're playing basketball down the street. <laughs> Could be that too. Yes. But it, there's only so much time in a day. And so my list, I don't, I don't commute anymore. Uh, you know, I work from home most of the time. Um, and, uh, so the only time I listen to podcasts or audiobooks are when I go to the gym or walk my dogs. <laughs> That's it. My listening time is, has been cut dramatically. Nice. So, all right, let's jump into uh, the ambition today question of the day before we wrap up here. Um, so today's ambition today question of the day is what is the optimal work-life balance that lets you enjoy success um, and at the same time make all the time and energy worthwhile? This is a, an, an easy yet difficult question. Um, and you'll, uh, that will make sense in a minute. So f- depending on what you do, of course, uh, you know, working from home is, is that optimal. It will pr- provide that optimal balance, in my opinion. Um, now, I run a software company. Uh, you know, uh, I have people that, you know, my team is in New York and Massachusetts. Uh, we have some contractors. We have one in Kiev and we have someone in Minneapolis. Um, but, you know, we can collaborate just like you and I are collaborating, you know, working together right now, Kevin, on, on uh, using video conferencing. God, video conferencing has changed everything. Google Hangouts, when it works, has changed everything. Um, and so I don't spend, uh, you know, okay, so we talked about my move from New York City to, to Austin. I lived, actually, I tell people I'm a native New Yorker, and I am, but, you know, we moved to Maplewood, New Jersey. Uh, primarily because it was a great little town, but also because it had a great commute to, to Midtown. And so it would take me less time from Maplewood on the train to get to Midtown as it would my co-founder who came from the Upper West Side, right? So it was that close. But, you know, I don't waste, I don't waste any of that time anymore. You know, I get up, I get my exercise goals in, I get my son off to school, uh, you, know, uh, uh, I, you know, I get my dogs for a walk, I sit down, I plow through my work without interruption unless it's scheduled. You know, yes, occasionally my wife will knock on the door and ask me for something, but like it's nothing like being in an office where people are constantly sucking up your time for just for the sake of being social. And which is there's the time to be social, but in my point, my perspective, it's not the middle of a work day. It's just like, let's go for drinks later. Let's go to the, you know, let's go to the gym together. If yo, you like to mountain bike, let's go mountain biking together. Like, let's do that but not in the middle of workday. So I think working from home is tremendous. It's a, it's, if you can do it, if your business allows for it, 
um, if you have, if you work with professionals, people who are senior enough that you can, they don't need a lot of handholding. Um, it just, it changes everything. All right. Awesome. So that, that is the secret. Um, all right. Well, I want to thank you for coming on uh, today's episode. So thank you. It's been thank great. you, sir. It was a lot of fun. Where can people go find out more about you? Oh, uh, well, this the easy that I'm gadget boy. I'm gadget boy everywhere. Um, uh, if you want, uh, ping me, uh, ping me at gadget boy on Twitter. Uh, and I'm happy to tell you the story behind that nickname. Uh, you can also, uh, go to eventhero.io, uh, slash power core. If you want, you know, if you want to get to see what's coming, go to slash power core and uh, check me out there. Otherwise just Google me. I'm gadget boy. All right. Great. Well, thank you. And, uh, I have to, I have to come out to Austin, uh, very soon. Actually, I'll, I'll come, uh, catch up with you and I'll come, uh, see how my brother's doing at UT Austin, hook em horns. And, uh, I'll see you on another episode of ambition today. Sounds good. Thanks, Kevin. All right, take care. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Ambition Today with your host, Kevin Siskar. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit www.siskar.co. We'll catch you next time.